Martha. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. We will get started in just a few minutes. If you haven't already, please go ahead and rename yourself in Zoom. 
in order to rename yourself, you can click on your name in the Zoom window where you appear and you can click on, um, click on your name again. And when it highlights blue, you can put the number in front of your name. And again, we'll begin in just a couple of minutes. Good afternoon, Alicia. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us. We are going to get started in about two minutes. In the meantime, if you can please be sure to rename yourself in Zoom in order to help us facilitate those breakouts, that would be great. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. It's about 2.05. Uh, we are still seeing people trickle in, so hopefully uh, the welcoming remarks will give everybody a chance to join in. Uh, we're glad you are all here uh, joining us today for this series on disrupting inequities. Uh, we think this topic is one that's critically important, uh, and we acknowledge that there's a lot to do in this space and a lot of inertia to overcome. Um, on behalf of Mr. Heyer and Tulare County Office of Ed, we want to thank you all for being here and taking these steps together. 
uh, all together uh, with each other and with us. Uh, and I'm going to invite Alicia Ramirez to introduce our special guest today. Good afternoon. I would echo Javier's sentiment. We are so grateful to see you all here today. And we are grateful to be uh, in the presence of Dr. Paul Gorski. Uh, Paul is the founder of the Equity Literacy Institute and Ed Change. He has more than 20 years of experience in helping educators, nonprofit workers, uh, and others strengthen their equity efforts. He's worked with educators in 48 states and a dozen countries. He's published more than 70 articles and has written, co-written, or co-edited 12 books on various aspects of educational equity, including reaching, teaching students in poverty, st strategies for erasing the opportunity gap, and case studies on diversity and social justice education with Seema Ponthi. He's the author of Multicultural Pavilion, an online compendium of free resources for educators. Paul earned his PhD in educational evaluation at the University of Virginia. He was a teacher educator at several universities and has done so for the past 15 years. He's also a published poet, a black belt in Taekwondo, and the biggest fan of Buster, his cat. We are so grateful, Paul, to have you back um, after an overwhelmingly positive response at last year's Equity Conference. Our audience knew they wanted to hear more and learn more and think about how we can um, move our effort forward here to overcome and disrupt inequities. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Gorski, for being here. Uh, well, it's totally my pleasure, and thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction of me and my cat Buster, uh, who likely will make an appearance at some point. Um, it's such a, a privilege to, to be with a group of educators. I know it's kind of a crazy time and uh, kind of a crazy and stressful time, and, and but you know, the work of equity, you know, it doesn't wait for us to to feel like we have more energy or, or more time. So, so here we are. Um, as you all know, this, this is the first in a sequence of uh, workshops that are gonna sort of build on one another. And the topic for tonight is uh, really just about developing a deep understanding of what in the heck equity and inequity are. Uh, so that when we, so that we can move into eventually talking about, well, then what does equity work uh, look like? Uh, I'm going to request that uh, everybody uh, uh, keep yourself uh, uh, muted, and, unless I uh, just so, so we don't have background noise uh, from anybody as we're. Uh, going through and there'll be times when I'm going to ask for, I think with this size of a group, we'll probably just use the chat box uh, to respond to some prompts. And then I think we're going to do breakout uh, rooms at, at one point as well. Uh, not sure what point we're going to do that, but it, it'll be uh, a little bit later. So um, I, I guess I want to do a screen share here. So let's see. And I think you all should be able to see, can I get a thumbs up? Uh, okay, good. Uh, so we're doing a deep dive into equity and inequity. And I think the idea here is that these words are sort of buzzwords often and people use them and, and maybe even more so now, uh, often without knowing or agreeing on what the heck we're talking about. And if there's one thing that I've learned working with schools and school districts and educational organizations over time, it's that starting with a deep shared understanding of equity is critical. Uh, otherwise, people are just sort of talking past each other, meaning uh, very different things. Uh, so that's sort of what we're going to work on. I, I do want to mention that I, I have two monitors. So if you see me looking in this direction, which might be kind of confusing, it's because I have the chat box on my monitor that's over here. Uh, so, and I just want to keep an eye on that in case anybody uh, posts a question there. Uh, but maybe uh, 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 try to make sure we get to your questions. And, and at any point, you know, if you have a question, you don't have to wait till we're at the end of a section or whatever. Just type it in the chat box, and, and if I don't see it, somebody will cut me off and, and let me know uh, that, that, it's, uh, that it's there. And again, I will be uh, 
I will have some prompts that uh, I will use and ask you to respond to those prompts uh, in the chat box. I want to start, you know, in the, uh, oh gosh, I see I have a little typo there. That is driving me crazy that that's there. Uh, but I'm going to try to, no, I'm not, I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to do a really quick uh, edit here. Okay, I feel so much better. I now can go on with the presentation. Okay, so um, I use a framework, uh, as many of you know, called equity literacy. How do we strengthen our literacy around equity? And one of the keys to equity literacy is sort of uh, cultivating in us the kind of ideological shifts or shifts in lens that will prepare us to do important institutional and uh, structural work. And we're gonna come back to that conversation in various ways throughout uh, um, the, the series of, of sessions. But uh, as I often talk about in my workshops, I think one of the biggest holdups in education is that we tend to look for solutions in uh, practical strategies and in popular programs. So, oh, there's a racial achievement gap. What combination of growth mindset and emotion regulation and learning styles can I piece together and try to solve this? Uh, the reason we do that is because we don't understand why racism exists and how it's impacting uh, education. And so we, well, we, when I say we, I don't mean every individual person who's on this session. I mean, we as a community of educators, what we tend to do is go through generations of solutions that have absolutely no shot at solving the problems we want to solve because we don't take the time to understand the problems. And this is just part of the culture of education. Uh, often I'll hear educators say things like, just tell me what to do. Just give me the five strategies. Just tell me what to do. And it's almost like we're sometimes offended by the notion that we actually have to take the time to understand what it is we're talking about. I just want to demonstrate to you just with one little example how important this is. Now, all of us know that research across the United States and across uh, your state and my state and every other state um, that that research shows that um, that black uh, Latinx and indigenous students are significantly more likely to be suspended or expelled than white students. We all know this research shows this and there are a lot of schools who are trying to do something about this problem. This is very clearly a racial equity problem. Now, I want to demonstrate for you why ideology is important. And I'm just going to use this example. This is an example we're going to come back to in a few sessions from now where we're focusing specifically on racial equity, but just really quickly. Uh, there are basically two popular ways that people understand why that disparity exists. Why, let's just say black students, why are black students suspended or expelled at higher rates than white students? Um, the most common explanation for that, that drives a lot of really bad policy and practice in education goes something like this. Well, yeah, of course black students are suspended or expelled at higher rates than white students because black students misbehave more than white students and they don't learn discipline at home. And again, you can substitute Latinx students, you can substitute indigenous students, whoever you want, but I'm just gonna use the example of African-American students, black students. Now let's say I work in a school and I look at our data and, I data and, my, and the data show that black students are suspended or expelled at disproportionate rates compared to white students. So let's say I see that in my school. Now try to follow me. I'm gonna ask you to really focus on this little thought exercise. So let's say I'm working at a school and, I, and the data show me that we have this problem, that disproportionately black students are being suspended or expelled compared to white students. Now let's say 
just for the sake of an example, that I believe that I believe that black students are suspended or expelled at higher rates than white students because black students misbehave more than white students. And at home, they don't learn the cultural norms to be able to behave in school. That, by the way, is the most common interpretation of this disparity among white educators. People have actually done research about that. Okay, so let's say again, we know that black students in our school are suspended or expelled at higher rates than white students. And we believe, we interpret that to mean that black students must be misbehaving more than white students. What is our solution gonna be? How are we gonna solve that problem if we believe that that problem is that black students misbehave more than white students. How do you solve a problem like that? If your belief system is the problem exists because black students misbehave, how do you solve that problem? And feel free to type something in the chat box. Yeah, Sheila says, I think it's pronounced Sheila says, stronger punishments. That's right. Uh, you will continue to crack down harder. <clears throat> right, okay, so y'all got it. <clears throat> so you all, you all have it. <clears throat> and in fact, if you look across the country, this is exactly what most schools are doing. Maybe they're adopting PBIS so that they can be clearer about behavior expectations, maybe they're teaching emotion regulation. Uh, you know, maybe they are doing mindfulness. But what most schools are doing in response to this disproportionality problem are trying to adjust something about black students, uh, Latinx students, indigenous students. We they need emotion regulation. They need to learn how to behave better. We need to, we need to more carefully explain the behavior expectations. Now here's the problem. So, so most of what's happening in schools to solve this discipline disparities are at, and all of these solutions that you all are naming are actually racist solutions to racism. They are racist solutions to a problem that is actually racism. Here's what the research actually shows is going on here. And this is based on studies that look at, there's one study that looked at over a million behavior referrals uh, in over 1,200 schools, looked at over a million behavior referrals. And here's what they found. What they found was that in point of fact, black students do not misbehave more than white students. Uh, in point of fact, what's actually happening is teachers, and especially white teachers, interpret the behaviors of black students more harshly than they interpret the exact same behaviors of white students. Same with Latinx students, same with indigenous identity students. So what's actually happening here is racism. There is no possible way to solve this problem by by uh, modifying the ways that black students behave. The only possible way to modify this problem is, is what? If we know that the problem is actually racial bias on the part of teachers, then what is our solution? So we say, okay, problem here is white, predominantly white teachers uh, applying discipline in a racially biased way. Now, what, if, if we recognize that as a, that the problem, what is our solution? to this problem. Eliminate racial bias in teachers, right? Now think about these two solutions. Solution number one, uh, crack down on the behaviors of black students. Solution number two, eliminate the racism. Do you see how different those two solutions are? And it's purely driven by this first box. It's purely driven by what ideology I am bringing into my interpretation of the problem. Now, if all we're going to, and, and again, the, the reason why we're not solving this problem is because the impulse in education is, well, what is the right combination of popular programs and initiatives to solve this problem? So that's where people are getting to behavior, 
uh, uh, emotion regulation, PBIS, and all that sort of thing, which have no shot at solving this problem. Absolutely no shot. In fact, what they do is make the problem worse because they obscure the real issue, which is racism. Okay, so, so this, is what I, this is our starting point here. If I am not willing to make the ideological shift, I am useless when it comes to creating more equity in a classroom or school. I got no shot at it. I got no shot at it. So what we need to do is the ideological work to inform the institutional work. Got to do the ideological work to inform the institutional work. Giving a teacher with racial bias five classroom management strategies uh, is not going to solve this problem. Right, but that's the solution. That's the common solution, right? Okay, so really quickly before I go on, I know I'm going on and on about this, but basically what the research shows is happening here, uh, and we'll go into this in more detail when we have a session specifically about race, but basically what's going on here is that teachers and particularly white teachers interpret subjective behaviors much more harshly and students of color than they do white students. Objective behavior would be something like a student punches another student. That's objective. Subjective behavior would be something like the student is behaving in an aggressive manner. That has to be interpreted. That behavior has to be interpreted. And what the research is showing is that the, the issue is only a small part of the issue is about objective behavior referrals. The biggest part of that disparity the, what is happening there is racism when it comes to subjective office referrals, subjective office referrals, uh, uh, racist approaches to subjective office referrals. That is the biggest portion of that disproportionality problem. So the only way that we can fix that is to eliminate the racism, only possible way. But how many schools can you think of whose primary strategy for eliminating the discipline gap is eliminating the racism? Yeah. The virtually none. Maybe in some small ways we're doing a little racial bias training, but really as a core strategy, virtually none. That's the holdup when it comes to equity work. That's the holdup. That's the precise holdup right there. Okay, so this is what we're going to start working on. Uh, consider what equity means deeply and robustly. We're going to talk about some equity literacy tools, although we're going to get more into the equity literacy tools in the next uh, session, which we'll is sort of focus more on that equity literacy framework. And then we're going to practice sort of applying some of those uh, terms. Uh, yeah, and uh, also this point here that we have to reflect on what we define as misbehaving. And that's, that's the part of the issue there. As again, especially for white educators, is what they interpret as misbehaving, uh, even if white students and students of uh, especially Black, Latinx, and Indigenous identity students are exhibiting the exact same behaviors, they're more likely to see it as misbehaving uh, in uh, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous students. And then on top of that, you might think about something like communication style, where maybe for me at home, you know, it's you demonstrate respect by just being direct and honest. And then, you know, a teacher does something and I'm direct and honest with the teacher. And now I'm being punished for being disrespectful to the teacher simply because I'm telling the truth of what I'm experiencing uh, in a moment. And again, something like that will often be interpreted differently if it's a white student and uh, uh, say a black student or a Latinx student. And Tony asks, is that only in classrooms? No, I, I mean, that's everywhere. That's, that's uh, I mean, I don't know if you're asking in classrooms whether, whether that happens in other areas of schools. It absolutely does. And not only that, it happens in law enforcement. I mean, that's part of what is happening with the murders of unarmed uh, Black and, and not just Black, uh, also Latinx and Indigenous uh, unarmed uh, people. Is there's kind of the same thing as, as uh, operating there. So, uh, all right, so I want to go to what might seem like kind of a simple conversation, but I, I think it's just kind of a good little exercise here. Um, 
What is equity? I want to just throw that out to you. What is equity? How do you define, how do you define equity? Because again, I think this is just kind of one of those uh, kind of buzzwords that, that we hear a lot and, and don't necessarily share an understanding. So what is, what is equity? How would you define equity? Uh, responding to everyone in the same manner of behavior, uh, ensuring access to all, giving every student what they need. Okay, these are uh, very common sort of definitions of equity that, that we'll talk about. Everyone is okay. And we don't see disparities in high numbers. That's an interesting way to uh, reflect on it there. Getting barriers out of the way. Okay, th these are great, you know, and keep, uh, keep typing those in. Uh, when I think of, uh, so in the work of the Equity Literacy Institute, when we're working with schools, we have sort of crafted a kind of layered way of thinking about equity that, uh, that we have found particularly helpful because it touches on some very specific sorts of things. And we think of it in terms of three components. And I'm going to talk about each of these components uh, individually, but I kind of see them as kind of working together as kind of the machinery of equity. In the end, equity work is really about distributing access, opportunity, and participation in equitable and just ways, and fair and just ways. And so then the question is, how do we do that? How do we do that? So I want to talk about these three components. Uh, the first component, and I think some of you are kind of speaking to, uh, to this in the chat box, uh, that we have to distinguish equity and equality. And I'm sure many of you have seen, you know, all those kind of popular graphics with the kids trying to watch the baseball game or the kids trying to pick an apple off the tree. And I, I think those can be useful in some ways. I, I also think they're, they're a little simplistic. Um, um, and so, you know, so uh, if, if we use those, we have to make sure we're talking through some of the complexities. So the difference mainly between equality and equity is that equality, an equality approach doesn't recognize the unlevel playing field. It doesn't recognize the existing disparities. And what I mean by that is if I come to school and I have this level of access and you come to school and you have this level of access, and maybe that's because of socioeconomic status, or maybe that's because of racial bias and systemic racism or whatever it is. But I have this level of bias and you have this level of bias. And then we come to school and school gives us all the same thing. We have all the same, uh, uh, you know, we all get sort of uh, the same access in school. We all get a little bump in access. The problem is that that gap in access is still there. So equity is about eliminating that gap in access. And here is the trick, and, and this is why uh, people with you know, more privileged and advantaged identities, this is what they're afraid of. The only way to eliminate the gap in disparities is to actively prioritize the interests of the people whose interests historically have not been prioritized. What that means is that we can't just keep doing equality. Equality just reproduces the inequity. What that actually means is how do we, how do we prioritize? What, what would happen if you completely rethought the way you did family engagement? Just completely start over and build your whole model for family engagement uh, so that it prioritizes access to uh, families that are learning English, to the lowest income families. Just rethink the whole thing, prioritize their interests. I mean, middle-class families can adjust to us doing family engagement however we do it. Families experiencing poverty cannot adjust to the ways that schools generally do family engagement. 
which they don't have access to because they don't have transportation and can't afford childcare and don't have paid leave and are working multiple jobs and feel marginalized when they do come to their kids' school often uh, anyway. So what if we just rethought the whole thing? What if we rethought how we organize kids academically in ways that actually prioritize the interests? You know, I, I often hear from people, well, you know, we, we've opened advanced classes and honored, honors classes to students of color and they just don't want to take it. Well, what if we completely recreated the curriculum in those classes to be Black-centric and Latinx-centric? I mean, if the, we're sending them to those classes and then in those classes is just reproducing the alienation and exclusion they experience in all their other classes, that's not, that's not equity. What if we actively prioritize their interests? Um, and and uh, I'm going to ask you for some examples of this, but uh, how offering, and, and by the way, you can look at what, what happens in states where that actually happens, like uh, where, uh, where uh, schools have tried to adopt uh, ethnic studies programs, Chicana studies programs, uh, and those sorts of things. And people are in an uproar. And it's like, we're only recreating for students who have been cheated out of equity, the thing that white students have had all along. All we're doing is offering other students the same thing and, and, and people lose their minds about that. I mean, that, that's, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, and, and that's a big hindrance to, to progress. Um, anyway, think about something like stringent tardy policies. Now, let's say I'm a Let's say I'm a middle class student and I ride the bus and I miss the bus. I'm a middle class student, so that likely means that uh, my, my parent or parents uh, probably work full time jobs uh, with paid leave. So, and probably they also own uh, some kind of stable transportation. So maybe they can come and pick me up and take me to school if I miss the bus. But let's say I'm in a lower income family and my parents work wage jobs and they don't have transportation, and I miss the bus, and they can't come and pick me up. It's got nothing to do with how badly I want to be in school. It's got nothing to do with how hard I work when I'm in school. It only has to do with access. So we have these two very different situations, and in the name of equality, that student from the lower income family is gonna face the same punishment as the wealthier kid for being tardy to school. That's how uh, equality reproduces inequity. So I want you to think about this. What is an example? So we're going to all through this series, we're going to have, I call these recognize exercises. These are, you know, um, and this is going to get us to step two of defining equity too. What is an, uh, so these are where we're actually practicing mapping out the kinds of inequities that exist in our schools. What, an, what is an example of a policy or practice in your classroom, your school, or your district that is applied equally, you know, like that tardy policy. It's applied equally, but because it's applied equally, it has a disproportionately negative impact. I mean, here I say students experiencing poverty, but it could really be anyone. It could be families that are learning English. It could be, uh, black family, you know, any, any already marginalized group of families. What's an example of a policy or practice that we might be applying equally, but because we're applying it equally, it will have a disproportionately inequitable impact. Yeah, homework policy, distance learning, fundraising is a great example. Uh, homework policies, state by literacy requirements, Yeah, a lot of people are mentioning fundraising. These are, these are excellent examples, excellent examples, right? So, so we gotta make sure this is one of the key parts of equity that, and this is part of equity literacy is recognizing how equality reproduces inequity. Equality reproduces inequity. I was working with a school and I did a policy analysis and they have a, you know, this kind of racist hair policy that says in part that uh, students are not allowed to wear dreadlocks that go below their shoulders. And I, what a ridiculous, I mean, first of all, 
that's a racist policy. Just on the face of it, that's a racist policy. And you got to think, what kind of thinking went into somebody, some people sitting around a table deciding that was going to be a policy? Those people should not work in education. You know, those are dangerous people, um, in my opinion. But but I, so I bring this up and I said, that is a racist policy. You have to change that policy right now. You should change that policy right now. Uh, there was this other policy where they had a, a parking fee. Uh, the school had a parking fee of $150 for the year. And I said, that's an inequitable policy. You need to change that right now, or at least you need to change that before students start coming to school again in person. So, um, but I said, you know, that hair policy, I was like, that, that's just very plainly a racist policy. And, and the uh, principal said, it's not racist because we apply it to everybody. I'm like, well, what do you mean you apply it to everybody? That is a policy that is very obviously targeting uh, uh, a uh, historically black hairstyle. That is, that is a racist policy, you know. So unless you have loads of people, loads of white people running around with dreadlocks, which in case you have to deal with that in the institutional culture of the school anyway, that's a separate issue that maybe needs to be looked at what's going on there. Um, but, but that's an example, right? Equality reproduces inequity. Ooh, AP exam fees, that's a great example too. All these are really great examples. Okay. So this gets us to our second, what we, what we just did in processing component number one is actually preparing us to talk about component number two. Uh, equity is about identifying and eliminating inequity. So if you can map out all of the stuff that people are calling equity work in your school or diversity, equity, and inclusion, or whatever it is, map all of that out in your school, you should be able to point, you should be able to describe how every one of those things is eliminating inequity, eliminating inequity. Identify the racism, eliminate the racism. That's what equity work is about. Not about helping students be more resilient against the racism, you know, not about celebrating diversity, although we should, I'm not saying we shouldn't celebrate diversity, I'm just saying that's got nothing to do with eliminating inequity. Identify the race, so, so a big, the, the heart of equity work is literally mapping out all the ways that inequity operates, map it out. The policies, the practices, the institutional cultures, what are all the ways, and we were actually just practicing that. We were just practicing that. If I'm not willing to do that as an individual in my own classroom, as somebody in a school, if I'm not willing to do that, I cannot do equity work. Because equity work is about identifying and eliminating inequity and then proactively cultivating equity. And that's what it gets us to this, uh, the third piece, which is that fairly distribute access and opportunity. So the second piece is almost like kind of the backward looking stuff. Well, here's all the stuff we've had in place from the past. Let's identify all of the ways inequity is operating in that and eliminate it. Eliminate the inequity and replace it with something more equitable. The third component is really more the forward looking stuff, which is, okay, from here forward, what are all the things that we need to do to make sure that this equity lens is informing everything, it's informing every policy, it's informing every practice? Is somebody sitting in the room saying, how is this policy going to impact our lowest income families? How is this policy going to impact our families who are learning English? How is this policy going to impact our Muslim families? Um, we fairly distribute access and opportunity by eliminating all the things that are creating unjust distributions of access and opportunity, and then putting in place things that are very purposely constructed, very purposely constructed to redistribute access and opportunity to, uh, until we can get to that level playing field. Again, what that means is actively prioritizing the interests of people whose interests historically have not been prioritized. It's the only possible way to do it. It's the only possible way to do it. And if we're not willing to do that, then really we're just equity posing. Really we're just posing. 
if we're not willing to do that. That's what the equity work is. Identify the transphobia, eliminate the transphobia. The ableism, the heterosexism, the Islamophobia, the racism, the economic injustice, all that sort of thing. Okay. I just want to pause here for a second uh, and uh, just see if anybody's got a, a thought or a question about that. We're, we're going to move from this into defining inequity and then defining, you know, creating a more sort of compact definition of equity. But any questions so far? Book fairs and fundraisers. It looks like somebody has, some people have been reading my work because those are the two uh, examples that I use uh, a lot. Uh, so Kate asks, how does uh, this policy program and by association, those dedicated resources and funding reach all students? I'm not exactly sure I'm following the question here. How does this, uh, those dedicated resources and funding reach all students, families, yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, you're giving us sort of a prompt that we have to ask ourselves. I, I mean, and, that, and, and that's a great question. Who are these reaching? Another great question is, who is this policy for? Who is this practice for? And whose image was this institutional culture design? Who is this really for? Who is this really for? Um, and oftentimes when you ask that, another way of asking that is, whose interest does this mostly serve? Whose interest does this mostly serve? You know, and when you ask that question, it really forces you to kind of peel back a little bit what, what, we're, uh, what we're doing. Okay, well, I'm gonna keep going then. Uh, I talk about, a, start with the definition of inequity. So those of you who are in my previous session, this is gonna sound, uh, I mean, when I was there in person, uh, this is going to sound uh, maybe familiar. So I think of inequity as being an unfair or unjust distribution of material and non-material access and opportunity uh, that result in both outcome and experience disparities that are predictable by things like race, socioeconomic status, gender identity and expression, and all, all of these, sexual orientation, you know, all of these things, right? So let's just pause here on a couple of these. Uh, I wanna make a couple of distinctions here. Material access. Material access refers to access to things that cost money, services and resources that cost money. So for instance, uh, well, just really quickly, if you think about what are the things that cost money, material things and services that some students have access to and others don't, but the students who have access to those things will be at an advantage in school. That would be an example of things like that. Their own technology, internet, competitive sports, extracurriculars, yeah, okay books, additional reading resources, great example, Gloria. Yeah, so um, you can also think of services. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, uh, Lisa mentioned tutors and, and uh, so, uh, you know, great uh, example. Well, now two of you have mentioned tutors, okay. Right when I was about to say it, y'all jumped in and stole it from me. So, uh, so tutors, uh, you know, expensive kinds of summer enrichment programs, right? Like uh, uh, robotics camp, you know, stuff like that. Okay, so those things are pretty easy to map out. And one thing we can ask ourselves is, is any portion of student assessment in the end really about what resources they have access to? Are we really assessing their ability? Are we really assessing their intelligence, or to what extent are we really assessing the what resources that they have access to? And that's where you start having conversations about things like homework. What are we really grading when we're grading homework? You know, what are we really assessing when we use some kind of standardized assessment to decide who gets into those advanced type classes? You know, what are we really measuring? 
Are we really measuring their ability or are we really measuring what kind of material access they had right up until the point we handed them that uh, assessment? So the other kind of access is non-material access. Non-material access has more to do with things that are related to institutional culture. And it can be something as simple as who has access to the most engaging teaching? The reality is we can usually predict that based on race, socioeconomic status, home language, even the thing that we should be able to count on as being distributed fairly is usually not distributed equitably in schools. Who has access to good teaching? Who has access to the most engaging pedagogies? Usually that is not even uh, usually we can predict that. Who has access to policy that was created in their image based on their material reality rather than someone else's image? Who has access to teachers who look like them and understand them and don't have biases about them? Uh, who has access just to an, to an institutional culture that was built around their culture instead of somebody else's culture, right? So this is that non-material access and it's a little harder to wrap our arms around, but we can get at a lot of the symptoms of it, which we've been doing sort of naming all these things. And we'll, we'll come back to that as well. The second distinction is between outcome disparities and experience disparities. Now, this is really uh, kind of interesting thing to talk about right now, because we're kind of in a phase of education policy that is really obsessed over outcome disparities, test scores, and, and it's even gotten to the point where some people who say they're talking about equity, what they're actually talking about is how to raise test scores. How, not about how do we stop marginalizing these kids so maybe you know, they will feel more empowered and do better in school. So we're gonna ignore that part and just how do we raise the test scores? How do we manipulate you know, higher test scores uh, out of people? So, you know, outcome disparities are an important component of equity. And in fact, some people define equity based on outcomes. Some people will say, well, it's about equitable access and opportunity. Other people say, well, that's not enough. It's really about outcomes. But my argument would be, if we attend to outcome disparities, plus we attend to experience disparities, then the outcome then we have the biggest chance at eliminating the outcome disparities and having equitable outcomes. And here's what I want you to think about. I can be, I can be a, a gay student who is getting straight A's, who's the president of my high school class, who's involved in every single thing, and who experiences homophobia and heterosexism every day at school. That, that's not equity. I could be a black student who is the valedictorian and involved in all of the organizations and president of my uh, high school student government and experience racism and experience invisibility in the curriculum. Uh, that's not equity. So we have to attend both to outcome disparities and to experience disparities, and to experience disparities. If anybody is experiencing racism in your school, it doesn't matter what else you're doing, that is not an equitable school. It doesn't matter what the outcomes are, that is not an equitable school. And here's the thing, and, and, and maybe this is a little different now during COVID, uh, if you work in a school, racism is happening all the time in your school. Sexism is happening all the time. My, you know, we do these focus groups uh, as part of the equity assessments we do. We do these focus groups uh, of students, like identity students from various marginalized groups. And, we, and one of the things we always ask them is, well, how often are you experiencing marginalizing? How often are you either experiencing or observing some kind of racism operating in your school or some kind of sexism. And the response has never been, well, one time last year and one time this year. The response is always every day, multiple times a day. Every day, multiple times a day, I am experiencing or observing something. And that is true in your school. 
because that's true in every school. The amount of sexual harassment young women experience in middle schools and high schools is completely outrageous. What they experience in hallways, what they experience in the, in the bleachers during sporting events. Uh, it is outrageous. And most adults, even though when they were in school, the same thing was happening or in complete denial of the amount of that that is happening every time girls or young women are walking through the hallways. Every time. It's ha it happens. It's happening literally all the time, whether it's getting patted on the ass, whether it's boys standing somewhere yelling out numbers to rate the appearance, uh, you know, it's happening all the time. It's happening all the time. And it doesn't mean that some of those young women aren't getting straight A's and doing really well academically. But if that is happening in your school, and it is, then that's not equity. That's not equity. Right? So we got to attend to that stuff and we got to attend to it proactively. So outcome disparities and experience disparities. And we can all, I, I was just talking through this, but we can all think of students like that. And maybe some of you were students like that. You did really well academically. Everyone just assumed you were very well adjusted and feeling very connected. But in reality, you were having to put up with a lot of stuff. And this is the other thing we hear in these focus groups is students saying, you know, because a lot of adults in schools will say, well, we're not, students aren't reporting it. The reason they're not reporting it is because they don't trust that we will do something about it. And what's actually happening is for mostly what's happening is the students are saying, I have a higher price to pay if I report this than if I don't report it. And my life will actually be easier if I just learn to cope with it. And that's what we hear over and over in these focus groups of, of girls and young women is, I will be socially punished if I report this. So what I have learned is this is just going to be my experience in school. This is just going to be my experience. That's the worst possible situation. They're just like, yeah, I'm just going to have to put up with this. Same with students of color. I'm just going to have to deal with these racist teachers. I'm just going to have to deal with being invisible in the curriculum. I'm just going to have to deal with constantly being asked to be the spokesperson for my entire identity group. You know. So, uh, so that's not equity. That's not equity. And we need some sort of, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go on a whole tangent about that. But when I, but you can imagine I'm hearing these stories every day. And I'm like, what the heck are we doing as adults? The damage that's being done. And what's even worse about this is half of those schools say they're doing trauma informed practices, while kids are being traumatized constantly. In, in the buildings. I always say the first requirement of trauma-informed practices is to account for all the traumas kids experience at school uh, and adults experience at school. Uh, if we're not starting there, then the whole trauma-informed thing is just a lie, you know, it's just a lie. So, um, okay. So I wanna uh, move from all that negative inequity talk to, okay, well, what the heck is equity then? So I think of equity as both a commitment to action and a way of being, a commitment to action and a way of being. Commitment to action. Equity is the process of redistributing access and opportunity to be fair and just. So again, uh, what, I want you, what I want you to think about is all the things that are happening in your school or your district or wherever in the name of equity. And ask yourself, can I describe how those things are redistributing access and opportunity to be fair and just? If you're doing something and you can't describe that, then it doesn't mean what you're doing isn't important. It just means what you're doing is not equity. So you have to rethink that. That means your grit and growth mindset stuff, those aren't equity. That means you're celebrating diversity that maybe that's important, but that's not equity. And we're going to talk more about that in a second. So the process of redistributing access and opportunity. Again, how do we do that? We do that by actively prioritizing the interests of the students who have been cheated out of equitable and just access in the past. The second uh, way I think of uh, equity is sort of the more aspirational way, sort of the way of being. The state of being free of oppression, the state of being free of racism, 
uh, transphobia, all of these sorts of things. So this is what we're sort of trying to work our way toward. And again, everything we're doing in the name of equity, we need to be able to explain how that is getting us closer to this state, to being actively anti-racist, actively anti-sexist. How are we getting closer to that? How are we getting closer to that? So this is really a framework that is built around a sense of urgency for high integrity equity work, highly transformative equity work, not nibbling around the edges, but just getting right in there and saying, all right, how are all the inequities operating? What do we do about that? So this goes back to those definitions you all shared. Uh, an equitable classroom or school is not just one where we focus on individual students' needs, but where we are actively identifying and eliminating all forms of bias, inequity, oppression, discrimination. Actively identifying and eliminating, not sitting back waiting for students to report it, but actively identifying and eliminating. And then actively developing anti-bias, equitable policies, practices, and institutional cultures. Now, really quickly, I want to say something about the common de definition of equity, which it often is something like giving everybody what they need in order to be successful. I think that's a definition that kind of comes out of the mindset that's sort of multi-tiered systems of support mindset where we have individual students, we got to sort of figure out where they fit. What is the level of support that they need and what are, the kind of, what are their kind of individual needs and how can we fill those needs? And that is one important piece of this. But what students need is to not experience racism at school. So where is that in those multiple multi-tiered systems of support? Where is what this student needs is for us to eliminate the racism they're experiencing, right? That's the problem with that definition is it focuses on sort of individual learning needs and, and, and maybe sort of social needs, social emotional needs. But what it doesn't address are the institutional problems that are perpetuating, you know, the, the, um, the challenges that, that that student might be facing, right? So institutional, the institutional work, right? This is it. And um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing, uh, is it Adriana? Uh, I think is making a really important point here that this is where the real work happens, uh, hard and unpopular. And there's a concept that we'll talk about when we talk about race, it's called interest convergence theory, it comes out of critical race theory. The, the idea of interest convergence theory speaks exactly to what uh, Adriana is saying there, which is that what, what is rewarded in schools, what is rewarded in leadership is not actually equity, but the ability to create the illusion of equity. So look at our neat student programming, look at our social emotional program, look at our growth mindset intervention. Uh, and, and that sort of stuff is celebrated. It's when somebody says, what are we gonna do about the racism? Right? That, that, that's what gets people's sort of uh, hackles up. And so what we end up doing, and by people, I mean often white people, I think it's important to acknowledge that. So what we end up doing is having an approach to equity that prioritizes the comfort of white people, prioritizes what they're willing to engage in over actual progress toward racial equity, over actual progress. So, so we wanna make sure we're not falling into that trap. Ah, I'm so far behind. Uh, and I, and I want to do a little small group thing. So I'm going to go through this piece kind of quickly and then, and then we're going to do like a five, really quick, like five or six minute uh, small group thing. So I want to sort of put this, you know, when I walk into any school and go to the whoever has the most power and say, are, are you committed to equity? As you can imagine, they say, of course, of course, we're committed to equity, right? And, and, and I believe in most cases, maybe not most, I believe in a lot of cases, that people really see themselves as being committed to equity. The problem is they're often misunderstanding what that means. So then if I say, well, what are you doing in service to that equity? Then most of what they say in response to that are things that create no equity at all. Uh, 
And so I want to kind of step through that and have you all do a little assessment of your own spheres of influence. So I want to talk about common approaches. So when I ask that question, the kinds of things people say that they're doing, what are, what, where are they actually falling? So I want to start with diversity appreciation. And I have this obnoxious graphic of a taco wearing a sombrero because when I was in elementary school in Sterling, Virginia, our diversity appreciation activity was taco night. And they would always send these invitations home that would have a graphic like this on it. Maybe a taco wearing a sombrero, maybe a little dancing cucaracha, maybe, you know, something very stereotypical. Diversity appreciation usually characterized by surface level diversity celebrations based on food, based on dress, based on very surface level cultural things. Um, often stereotype laden depictions of, of uh, people from marginalized communities. You know, the group Mexican people uh, and the group Mexican American people are hugely diverse. Uh, and in fact, within Mexico, there are regional conflicts because of cultural differences. And even in much smaller countries, uh, those exist. But what we often teach is something like Mexican culture. And then we teach it through the most stereotypical stuff like a taco and a crunchy shell with shredded cheddar cheese on it. That by the way, nobody in Mexico is actually eating tacos like that. Uh, so often very stereotype laden depictions. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't celebrate diversity, but I am saying we need to apply an equity lens to how we celebrate diversity. We need to apply an equity lens to how we celebrate uh, diversity. And I'm saying celebrating diversity in the end does not create more equity. It does not, and in fact, often celebrating diversity is really, if you talk about, across race, Celebrating diversity is really for white people, you know, for white people to have a soft landing spot to talk about, not to talk about racism, but just to talk about difference, you know. Uh, so if you look at a lot of the celebrating diversity kinds of activities that happen in schools, you say, and you ask that question, who is this really for? Who is taco night for? The other weird thing about taco night in my elementary school was that the Latinx people in my school were Guatemalan. They weren't, uh, they weren't Mexican. And that's the other thing that happens. Let's just use the taco, not just as a symbol of Mexico, but as the symbol of all of Central and South America, because all of those, we'll just call all those people Mexican. You know, and, and that's, I, I don't think that's the conscious process, the conscious uh, thinking that's happening, but that's often where it lands. Uh, you know, Puerto Rican people are Mexican, Peruvian people are Mexican, you know, that, that uh, sort of thing. So even the way we celebrate diversity often is not equitable. The second approach is cultural competence. Efforts to understand our own cultures and identities and how they inform the way we interact with people who have cultures and identities different from our own. This is important. I'm not saying this isn't important, but this still is an equity. I can understand a lot about some forms of Mexican American culture. That's not the same as understanding how uh, Mexican American people uh, experience racial marginalization, sometimes experience linguistic marginalization uh, and, and uh, other sorts of things. So uh, again, equity is identifying the racism, eliminate the racism. Cultural competence doesn't get us there. In fact, in a lot of districts, cultural competence is kind of a detour because people are more comfortable talking about culture than they are talking about racism, Islamophobia, heterosexism, and uh, those sorts of things. Uh, so, uh, okay, so that's cultural competence. Again, I'm not saying we shouldn't be culturally competent. What I'm saying is we shouldn't mistake cultural competence for, for uh, equity. Uh, the third step is getting us a little closer. It's inclusiveness providing a welcoming, engaging school environment that meets the needs of each individual student. That's important, of course. Ensuring curricula, learning materials, policies, and practices reflect the diversity and interests of the student body. Of course, of course, of course, that's important. Of course, that's important. But again, I'm falling just short of saying, okay, well, we can have policies that are representative 
We can have libraries that are representative and that sort of thing, but we can have that kind of representation and also sitting next to policies that are, that are uh, racist or ideologies that are racist. So what we want to get to is equity. And again, what is that? Identifying and eliminating all elements of inequity and then actively creating equitable policies, practices, and institutional cultures. Okay, that's where we want to go. And I think it's useful, and we'll do a little, uh, I'll have you all do a little thing around this uh, here in small groups in a second. You know, I think it's useful to kind of take a tally. I think it's also useful if I'm in a school and I'm part of some sort of equity committee or, or work group and we're having a conversation about equity and the conversation starts straying off into, well, here's a neat student program. We, maybe we should adopt this kindness matters program or, you know, you know, say, okay, let's talk about that later, but let's get back to how is inequity operating here? How are we gonna eliminate the inequity? How are we gonna actively cultivate equity? Kindness matters, got nothing to do with equity. In fact, kindness matters in the absence of equity there's a really twisted kind of uh, kindness to begin with. You know, when people bring me that kind of, the important thing is being kind. I'm like, if, if students who are marginalized can choose between kindness and justice, my guess is that most of them would choose justice. And what kind of kindness are you talking about if it's kindness in a context of injustice? That doesn't make sense. So again, it's that laser focus on equity. And once we have a handle on that, then we could do all this other stuff much more effectively. So, so here's what I want you to think about. And uh, maybe if we can uh, have uh, put people in small groups, maybe just for like five minutes for a little small group conversation. Here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about if you had to I know this is hard because we're talking across a lot of different issues, but if you had to say where your school is, the school that you currently work for, a district, whatever level in which you work, or, or your organization, on average where you are, where, where is most of the focus when it comes to this sort of thing? Is, is it, is, where are most of the resources going? in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or uh, where are most people willing to engage, you know? And, and another interesting conversation is, at what point in this continuum do you start experiencing resistance? Most people aren't gonna resist celebrating diversity, but you start getting into that inclusiveness and equity, and that's where people like, oh no, now you're redistributing my access and opportunity. So here's what I want you just to reflect on a little bit in your, in your small groups. And I know some of you will be with other people in your team in your small groups. Um, where are you? Where is your institution on this continuum uh, right now? So can we break people up just for like five minutes in those small groups? And then we'll come back and, and uh, process a little bit. All right, I will send everybody off. Well, it looks like almost everyone is is out. So, so what happens? So, so you, I think there's a mechanism where you do something and then they have like thirty seconds and then it brings them back. Is that how? Yes. It? So, um, I actually put them in there. So there's a timer that I can actually put for them, um, and it'll notify me when their timer is up for the five minutes. And then, I actually instead of doing the sixty seconds to come back, um, it'll. It, it'll actually be 15 seconds. I, I kind of minimize their window there. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you for helping with this. It really, uh, it allows me to really focus on the, the content and not have to worry about the, <laughs> yeah. the more technical stuff. I know what you mean. No worries, you are very welcome.
Hi, Tiffany. I just broke everybody out into breakout rooms. Um, do you know what group number you're in? I do. I'm in the breakout room, but I, the problem was I was on remotely and I didn't have access, so I got off my remote access. Okay. So I am actually in, let me see what my other one was, just a moment. I see you in room 11. Is that okay. correct? Does that, does that make sense? I think so. Okay. I think so. <laughs> Let's see. It looks like, ooh, what do I see that at? Yes, 11. Okay, let me see. Here we go. Okay. I'm going to assign you now. Thank you. You're welcome. It always amazes me how fast the time goes by in these things. Oh, yeah. It's so quick. It's crazy. Yeah. I'm used to doing these day long things where by the end, I'm just so exhausted. I, I want the time to go by faster. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but these, it just feels like, you know, I, I'm just getting revved up and then it's like, oh no. And then it's, it's already over. <laughs> but I feel, I feel a little more exhausted doing these than in person. Maybe it's because you're staring at a screen for so, so long. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I definitely, by proportion of time, I, this is more exhausting. <laughs> yeah. It's also because um, I got to figure out a way to, I got to have a standing desk, I think. I think oh, yeah. to do this and project while I'm sitting down. I think for some reason it's harder on my vocal cords than if I was hmm. standing up. That's interesting. Yeah. We have some, I, um, did some research and I found some electric stand-up desks because we don't, it's just like this one that goes on top of the actual desk since the desk doesn't move up and down itself. They're pretty handy and they're small and not bulky. Mm. Pretty cool. Found them on Amazon. It's a Victor brand. Would you, uh, would you mind sending me a link to, to that? I yeah, absolutely. That. I will definitely do that. And Paul, um, were you planning on sharing your um, slide deck with everybody after this, or could you? Uh, I'd be happy to. Okay. Uh, people, is, it, is the best way to do that just to send it to you, and then you can, or, or yeah. I could just drop it in that folder? Or? Whichever way you want to do it. You have access to that folder, and you can definitely just pop it in there. Um, if not, you can just email it to me, and I'll put it in there for you, too. Okay. And they are 20 seconds. Almost done, plus the 15 seconds, so about 30 seconds. All right, Paul, looks like people are coming on in. All right. The Zoom is repopulating. Okay. I think I think we have pretty much everyone back now, right? So um so I, I um, so thank you all for uh, for being willing to go and have those conversations. I don't think I need to have anybody report out the rating that you gave your institution. But, uh, but I would love to hear what it was like to have a conversation about trying to get a sense of where your institution is. What did it feel like to try to do an, kind of an honest assessment of that? Uncomfortable. <laughs> Uh, Dana, I really appreciate that your comment there, thankful that it felt safe. I mean, that's really important, right? If we're going to have honest conversations, you know, uh, we have a lot of work to do. Oh, okay. And then other people are saying people aren't feeling safe uh, to share. Yeah. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. So here's what I, you know, and, and again, you know, I know this is hard because I'm sure there are some of us who feel like we're kind of the loud voices in our institutions and and it's and sometimes there are people who feel kind of alone in their own institutions uh, doing this work and it can be hard, but especially if you're working with a group, I think that the, the mindset we have to practice that I think can help us in the long run, uh, you know, from burning out uh, is the mindset is it's hard, but every hard thing we do, we need to see as a kind of a triumph because there's no path forward that doesn't have some discomfort that isn't hard, you know. Uh, so we, we have to see being willing to be in the hard stuff as kind of a triumph. And we also have to remember as hard as it is, it's not harder than being the student who's experiencing the racism. It's not harder than being the student who's experiencing the transphobia. So if it being hard and it being difficult and emotional, uh, you know, if we are redistributing that difficulty off of the backs of children and onto our own backs, we have to see that as in and of itself a fair redistribution of uh, difficulty. Uh, uh, and that also is going to get to something I'm going to talk about in the next workshop when we talk about uh, sort of how we pace uh, equity work. So um, the last sort of uh, content piece I want to talk about with uh, equity is the difference between mitigative equity work and transformative equity work. Now, let me say up front that we want to be doing both mitigative and transformative. The problem is Generally, we're, generally schools aren't doing both. Generally, schools are doing mitigative equity work. So we're basically leaving the core inequities in place, but uh, then maybe just sort of nibbling around the edges. So what do I mean by mitigative versus transformative? I want to use a non-education example. If you think about in your community, in your community, not just your school community, but your larger community, if you think about most of the things that people and organizations are doing, most of the ways that they're spending their energy trying to support people who are homeless. What are some examples of those things? What are most of the kinds of things that people are putting effort into in your community when it comes to uh, addressing homelessness or supporting people who are homeless? Uh, Christina says feeding, uh, providing food, clothing, maybe some temporary shelter, Blankets. Okay, right. So we're sort of getting all of these sorts of things, maybe finding a location for some temporary shelter. Now, if you look at all of those things, you take a, that whole list of things and ask yourself this, which one of those things is a threat to the actual problem of homelessness? Which one of those things is a threat to the actual problem of homelessness? Zero is the correct answer. I love that zero in all caps because we want to be dramatic and now we say zero. You are exactly right. So most of what's happening is very mitigative. What are the sorts of things I might be putting my energy into if I wanted to eliminate the problem of homelessness? So housing, certainly affordable housing. Uh, now, Jennifer said job placement. Now, now this, is, this is a really good example. I would actually call job placement mitigative, not transformative. One, placing one person in a job, that might mitigate, that, that might transform their experience. But if the bigger set of problems is actually there aren't enough jobs in this country that pay enough money for everybody to have one full-time job and not end up homeless. That's one of the reasons homelessness exists. Uh, and so if we don't solve that as an underlying, underlying issue, we might solve that homelessness problem for one person, but whoever else was applying for that job, that's not solving it for them, uh, right? So, you know, think about things like, you know, living wage campaigns, I mean, in a way, living wage campaigns are still mitigative in the bigger economic sphere and all those things. Um, 
Uh, mental health care, again, you know, I think mental health care is really important, but if I have mental health care and still can't afford housing, then I am still going to end up uh, homeless, right? So, so it's probably some combination of these things. Uh, so, uh, you know, when, when we take it sort of into school, we want to ask ourselves, when we're mapping out the inequities, are our responses to those inequities uh, really just about how do I help students be a little bit more comfortable in the context of those inequities? How do I help a few more students access uh, more engaging teaching in, the context, in a context in which uh, access to engaging teaching is still inequitable overall? Or are we doing something that's more transformative, like changing the teaching so that everyone has access to the most engaging pedagogy so that we're not hiring people to teach who don't demonstrate the ability to teach in ways that are going to be engaging to, to, to children, right? So I think about this in terms of uh, two uh, parables. Uh, and I can't remember if I've shared these uh, w when I was there, but uh, the first is the starfish parable. And, and I often call mitigative programs in schools, I call them starfish initiatives. So starfish parable goes something like this. There's a young woman walking on a beach and she notices that a bunch of starfish have washed up on the shore and they're drying out on the shore. And she's picking up the starfish one by one and throwing them back in the water. And an adult comes along and says, there are hundreds of starfish drying out. You're, you're never going to make a difference. And she picks up a starfish and says, well, I made a difference to this one and throws it back in the ocean. Now, I'm, does anybody get some warm fuzzies from the starfish story? The, the problem is, especially I find in a US context, that we're led to believe that this is how change happens. And you often hear people say, if I make a difference for one person, then, you know, my, my work is done. But when it comes to equity, I can make a difference for one person. Everybody else is still experiencing the inequity, right? So I want to still make a difference for that one person. But at some point, we have to do what this other person did. This is the babies in the river parable. This isn't Moses. This is totally different baby. So... Um, and, and I hate the idea of babies in a river, so instead I used an obnoxious photos of white people floating in inner tubes down a fake river. So I don't know, needed a photo, that's what I plugged in there. So, so this story, a young woman is uh, on a river, uh, by a river bank, and she sees a baby floating down the river, so she saves the baby, puts the baby in the grass, and she turns around, there's another baby floating down the river saves the baby, puts the baby in the grass. And uh, the more time she does that, the more babies are floating down the river. Next thing you know, the entire village is down by the river, saving babies uh, and putting them in the grass. And that original woman starts walking up the river, walking away from the group, and everyone is, everyone is furious with her. Where, where are you going? We have to save the babies. And she says, I'm going to go find out how all these babies keep ending up in the river. That's, that's the transformative piece, right? So, uh, you know, change a racist hair policy. That's mitigative, right? We're changing one policy. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. We absolutely should do it. But the question, the deeper equity question, and this will be a good bridge to our next session where we talk about equity literacy. A deeper equity question is, how did we end up with a racist hair policy? What was the thinking? Who was sitting around making a decision that we were gonna charge students $150 for a parking space? Who thought that was a good idea? What was the kind of thinking that went into that? You know, what was the kind of thinking that allows us to keep allowing language arts teachers who don't know how to talk about racism to teach Huck Finn and To Kill a Mockingbird and all the damage that is doing year after year after year because those teachers say, well, I enjoy teaching Huck Finn. Right? So why aren't we doing something about that? Right? So uh, transformative, getting at the root 
of the issues. If we don't address what is the racist thinking that went into that hair policy, that racist thinking is still being applied to every other policy and practice. Right? Uh, so, so we got to think transformatively. We got to think transformatively and not just sort of nibble around the edges of things. The truth of the matter is that we have to do both. Right? We don't want people who are homeless to starve to death while we're fomenting the bigger revolution. The problem is that uh, societally, we are not doing both. There's a, a tiny, tiny percentage of people who are working on the issue of homelessness are working on it from a transformative point of view. The vast majority of people are working at it, doing coat drives, volunteering in soup kitchens, and that sort of thing which is actually just perpetuating uh, the, the, the uh, problem. It's helping people who are homeless be a little bit more comfortable as people who are homeless, right? So what, what, are, what are the root ideologies? What are the root parts of institutional culture that are perpetuating inequity? That's what we want to get. That's that transformative piece. Uh, in the next session, we're going to be talking about the equity literacy framework, which provides tools for us to identify those things and work on those things. So, th so this is going to bridge us to that. I just want to end by talking about kind of a few places to start. What are the key equity places to start? Uh, the first one is driving out deficit ideology. And again, we're going to have a whole session just on understanding, being able to recognize the impact deficit ideology has and how to address deficit ideology. Deficit ideology is the tendency to think that we solve, let's say, racial disparities by adjusting something in people of color. So that example that I talked about with the, um, you know, we solve discipline disparities by fixing the behaviors of Black, Latinx, and Indigenous students. That's deficit ideology. Deficit ideology identifies the source of the problem as existing within the marginalized community. It's because of deficit ideology that we have grit initiatives in schools all over the country, and we have almost no anti-racist initiatives anywhere in the country. That's deficit ideology. We need them to be more gritty and resilient, rather than we need us to be less racist. We need our institutions uh, to not be, not less racist, anti-racist. Got to correct myself. A great place to start with and to practice honing your equity perspective is policies and student conduct handbooks. Student conduct, conduct handbooks are usually full of policies and practices that uh, look like they're being applied equally but have inequitable outcomes. Uh, and you can look at it through a specific identity to just practice. Start with socioeconomic status, because that's the easiest thing to see in those handbooks. All of the policies and practices and punishments that end up being harsher on families experiencing poverty than other families. Right? Um, so that's a great place to start uh, practice. Uh, another thing to think about is, you know, ask the most marginalized members of the community what the issues are and believe what they say. I think we have a tendency to ask and then not believe what they say. So we gotta ask and believe what they say. You know, we have districts and schools that pay us tens of thousands of dollars to do these sophisticated equity assessments when really all they have to do is ask the most marginalized people in their community what they're, what's going on and believe what they say. If you're not willing to change what you're doing based on what they say, and it's actually oppressive to ask if you're willing to change what you're doing based on what they say and, and to not invalidate them. Um, that's a good place to start. Uh, start with ideology. I think we talked about that enough. Ideology drives practice. There are no sustainable shifts in policy and practice without shifts in ideology. A person with a racist ideology cannot create equitable anti-racist policy and practice. And that's a good point, by the way, if you have like a diversity committee or an equity work group in your school, that group needs to be made not of people volunteering, but of the people who are the farthest along in their understandings of, of, uh, of uh, equity. Finally, detrack. What we know based on research now is there's no justification for that sort of capital T tracking uh, 
uh, that, uh, that happens in schools. There's no justification for it. What the research most recently has shown is that the highest achievers are going to achieve at the same level, even if they're in mixed ability groups. People have been justifying tracking, mostly based on research that shows the 5% of highest achievers do better if they are pulled out uh, into high achieving group. And what the latest research shows is that's actually uh, not true. Plus, we know that all of that, all those sort of track, big T tracking uh, processes are, are very, um, um, uh, racially biased, class biased, language biased, and all those sorts of things. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Here's my contact information. Again, the next place we're going is uh, the equity literacy framework, which will just give us tools to put this vision of equity uh, into, into practice. Um, sorry, we sort of ran out of time before I could uh, take questions but I'm happy to stay on. If you have to log off, feel free to log off, but I'm happy to take a question or two if anybody wants to uh, stay on and, and ask a question. We will leave the space open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Gorski. We really appreciate you being here with us, um, offering the opportunity for thought provocation and reflection. We look forward to seeing you and um, everyone again on October 14th, which is a week from today. So um, we will hang on the line, but thank you so much. Uh, please go ahead and, and drop any comments that you want to share with Dr. Gorski in the chat box. I do have a question. Sorry, I was going to ask something, but the uh, chat was flooding with thank yous. <laughs> um, so I, this was brought up in our breakout. And so like we're a charter school, so we're a school of choice. And I know that like whenever you were thinking about like practices, policies and stuff like that, like who's in our mind, like who are we thinking about, who are, who's creating these things? And I was like, well, yeah, like so for example, one of the things that we did at the beginning of the year was like, we were like, okay, we're going to think about all of our families and, you know, we're going to be super flexible and we're going to create this um, uh, schedule where that's kind of staggered. That way all kids aren't all on Zoom at once and like clogging up their internet feeds at home, right? So then we ended up doing that. We tried it for a week and then uh, we changed it because we had a lot of like, you know, complaints from all in teachers, parents, everything like that. And then I felt like, it was pressure, so then we ended up changing our schedule so everyone starts at the same time. Um, when we're a school of choice or whatever, right? Does that then still hold true? Like, are we still then thinking about the people who have historically been oppressed, um, those that have been at disadvantage um, in schools? Like, does, does my question make sense? I'm not, I'm not sure uh, what, what the question is specifically there. Okay, so like, I guess because we're a school of choice and because we are a charter school and so our demographic does look different than if it was a neighborhood school. Um, when we're like, you know, the neighborhood kids all come to and stuff instead of like, yeah. we're a school where everyone's coming from different places. Does then our practices, our policies, the people who are in charge, should they be then making policies with those people who have been historically been oppressed in mind? Well, yes, I mean, I think so. I, I mean, I, in a way, you have more responsibility to, to do that in the biggest sense, uh, I think, because uh, how are you making sure that if you're a choice school that you're, ex I mean, the big critique of charters and of choice schools uh, is that generally in, in the biggest sense of that uh, situation, that generally they create more choice for the families who already had the most choice, not necessarily uh, the most choice for the families who already had the, the least amount of choice. So at that level, I think so. But then even in the context of the students that you do have, uh, you know, uh, there are always inequities and you can look across socioeconomic status, race, home language. You can also look across uh, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression. You know, there, there are a lot of uh, areas that, uh, you know, that need attention. I don't really know the demographics of your school, but even schools that would, that are, you know, even if I worked in a school that was all white and all middle class or wealthier, I would still have the same sort of sense of urgency, um, or, or not all, but predominantly white, predominantly uh, 
uh, wealthier uh, people. I, I would still have the same sense of uh, urgency. Okay, no, that totally um, makes sense. Like I just, um, because then I don't know if then like, uh, if my mind should be shifted so that way, I don't know, it almost sounds like, I don't know, it sounds like I'm sitting on a fence right now. Like, I don't know if I should be doing all these productive things to move forward and keep growing and learn all these things. That's my passion to do. Or do I kind of like, I guess like regress and then just kind of like stay to what's like the norm or stay like to what the status quo is because of the people that I'm serving. I don't know. That's what a big conflict that I guess I was having internally, but thank you for answering the question. I appreciate You're welcome. it. Mr. Gorski, could I add on to that <laughs> as an administrator at that school? Sure. Where I struggle with is some of our families to switch our model was, could be difficult for them, could add a burden. And at the same time, some of those families that are marginalized, my, some of the socioeconomic ones that I was talking to, it was a big burden to them to have a lack of structure. And they were coming to the pickup of resources. Some were saying they were near tears and they couldn't handle it. So as a leader, I morphed the structure to accommodate the majority, but some now fit into this category and some now struggled. And so it's this angst of, do you have to go with the majority knowing you can't reach 100% to have flexible for every child? I guess that's where I struggle as a leader because my heart has definitely been to learn and grow. I'm, I admit I'm nibbling hands down, but I'm excited to learn to dig in, right? Yeah, I mean, and I think that goes back to what I was saying about the sort of prioritization principle. You think about well, here are the families who can adjust to however we do this. They have the resources and the wherewithal to adjust to however we do it. That might be 99% of the families. An equity approach would be, okay, well, let's look at the families who can't adjust to however we do it. And let's do it the way that's going to make it most accessible to, to them. The, the difficulty is there is no silver bullet. So, you know, so you got a lot of this work is about finding the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not going to be one way to do it. That's going to work for all families who are struggling economically. So you say, okay, well, how can we sort of piece together an approach here that's going to be responsive to the challenges those families are facing. There's not going to be, you know, and sometimes, sometimes there's this equity ideal. Like I can, I know what the equity ideal is, but then there are all these circumstances and the equity ideal butts up against the circumstances. So I got to figure out, okay, well, how do I get as close to the equity ideal as I can um, in the context of those circumstances? So, you know, I, I think we have to let ourselves, uh, we have to allow ourselves to not think we're going to reach some kind of equity purity that is going to fix everything. I, you know, I think sometimes being equitable is about being, uh, you know, being uh, responsive to the various challenges that families face and saying, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna make this as equitable as we can, and then we're gonna build in supports around that. Um, so there you have that sort of mitigative and transformative thing happening at the same time. That makes sense. Like now the students we see that are struggling, we're planning to bring in and extra supports on campus and, and those that we know are having a hard time at home. So we're trying to scoop that next group in. That makes sense. I got it. Or I got it to nibble. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Thank you so uh, much. All right. Well, uh, we're about uh, 10 minutes over here. So I guess I have to kind of excuse myself, but I really hope to see you all uh, in the next session. And in the meantime, if you want to check out the Equity Literacy Institute webpage for some resources, the link is there. So thanks. And thank you all for helping me with the technological aspects of this. This I think this went really smoothly, except that I was confused about the start time. So I was freaking out about why I couldn't log in at uh, <laughs> an hour before it started. You are very welcome, Dr. Gursky. And Dr. Gorski, will those slides be uploaded into the folder for folks to access and revisit later? Yes, uh, either I will figure out how to do that or I will email those uh, to somebody who can do it. I'm sending right. you an email now. Um, you can just email it to me and I'll place them in the, in the folder. Okay. 
All right, I will email those uh, as soon as we log off here. All right, thank you so much. Wishing everyone a great afternoon. Thanks, see you all next time.